Right, let's have a look at this. So when a continuous when a continuous spectrum of light from a hot source is passed through cool, low pressure hydrogen gas, the spectrum observed on the other side shows dark absorption lines. Explain the origin of these lines. So this is what we did in class. This is the absorption spectrum. Spectrum. Hmm. The, I have my or my euler on my spectrum. Okay. Do you remember this? Um, we had the uh, absorption and emission spectrum, and they want to know what's the deal with the absorption spectrum. So, what happens is electrons require certain. certain energy levels to be provided so that it can be freed. The light provides the energy And since energy is proportional to frequency, then certain frequencies are absorbed. Whew, something like that should do it. So I'll read it again to you. Electrons require certain energy levels to be provided so that it can be freed. The light provides the energy, and since energy is proportional to frequency, then certain frequencies are absorbed. Can you see okay? Got that? Yeah. Cool. Let's look at the next one here. Oops. Some of the energy levels of hydrogen are shown below. Determine the frequency of photon required to excite an electron from ground state to n equals 2. Right, so in the ground state, the energy is minus 13.59 electron volts. And in state n equals 2, the energy is minus 3.4 electron volts. So the difference between the two is how much energy is required. So if you did 13.59 minus 3.4, and then multiply that by E, that would give you the energy. But we know that energy equals HF. So... If you do that and divide your answer by H, you get the frequency. So when, once you're ready on your calculator, you can give me that, no problem.
let's see, 2.46 times 10 to the power of 15. Yep, hertz. Super duper. It's Planck's constant. Okay, B part two. When hydrogen atoms are excited to state three, give the energy level in electron volts of all possible photons which can be emitted. Hmm, okay. So this one's a little bit weird, but it's not, it's weird because you need to figure out what they want. So what they're saying is, you have energy level three, and this releases a photon if it suddenly drops down to energy state two. Let me think if I got that the right way around. Yeah, so what happens is when it drops from three to two, it loses energy, but energy can't be destroyed. So what happens is a photon is released. And likewise, when it drops down from three to one, a photon is released. So the question really is asking you, what are, what are the two energies of these two photons? So it's just going to be the difference between three and two and the difference between three and one. So the difference between three and two is that minus minus that, that's energy one. And energy two is that minus minus that. So minus minus makes plus. Ah, so what's what's that if you could be so kind? Now you can leave it as energy volt uh, electron volts. Now, I suppose if I'm being a good little student, I should use three significant figures. So that second one should really be 12.1 electron volts. But I feel like in the marking scheme, they would kind of forget to do that. I suppose I could have a look and see. Ah, not later. Okay, B3. When the same light is directed through a different cool, low pressure gas, no absorption lines are visible. Suggest a reason for this observation. Ah, that's interesting. Why? Now, what light? What light did we shine through? <coughs> so it's not it's not super clear in the question, but at the very start it says when a continuous spectrum of light. Now, if I I don't know if they mean just a certain like a certain range of frequencies, you know, like um, say green light or red light or something like this. So it's possible that the reason there's no absorption lines is because the no frequency in this light directed through the gas matches what the electrons require. So um, that's what I'm going with, and then I'm gonna check the answers. Um, no <coughs> frequency of directed light matches required uh, frequency. Now, let's just see what the marking scheme says. I, I'm kind of worried I'll be disappointed. Right, let's see. Well, good news is our answers so far are right. Ah, 
We forgot one here. We did 3 to 2, and then we did 3 to 1. But it's also possible it goes from 3 to 2, and then 2 to 1. So we forgot to do 2 to 1. So there's a third answer here, which we missed. Uh, so what was 2 to 1? Oh, that's so sneaky. Oh. So the third possible answer is minus 3.4 plus 13.59. Ten point one one. Ten point two. Now, what's on, what what's annoying about this part three question is it's two marks, and my answer is actually right. I get one mark, but the question says suggest a reason, and it looks like you need to give actually two reasons, which. It's a bit of a pain. So, I would have only I would have only gotten one mark here. I need to give another reason. So it says you can give credit for any other reasonable answer. So, uh, one thing that's important about this is that you shine the light through. A low density gas so perhaps the new gas you're using its density is too high so another reason we give is a uh, density is too high that's also possible um, so yeah actually you know what you could go back to the question so at the beginning of the question it says when light from a hot source is passed through a low pressure gas. So the other thing you could then say, which I see is in the marking scheme, is that the pressure is too high. Okay. You know, that's funny, Matt, because I just saw that now. And in the marking scheme, it says that you could say that the pressure is too high. But I see that you said, in the question, it says it's already low. <coughs> so perhaps you could say it's not low enough. So you could say that the pressure is not low enough. But then you, can, you see that it says it's cool. Then I guess you could say it's not cool enough. I don't know. This is it's what's in the marketing scheme. I'm a bit annoyed that it's uh, you need to give two reasons, two two suggestions. Okay, let's see the next one. In the emission line spectrum from the hotter samples of a gas. Emission lines correspond to transition from higher levels down to lower levels and stronger. Then those from lower levels down to the ground state. Suggest an explanation for this. Okay. That's really making you think. Goodness. In the emission line spectrum from hotter samples of a gas, emission lines correspond to <coughs> transition from high levels down to lower levels are stronger than those from low levels ground state. Ah, okay, so once you understand the question, he's asking you uh, why is it that if you go from a high state, like say n equals 5, down to a low state, like n equals 2, why is that stronger, that means brighter, that means more energy, than if you go down from a state from n equals 2, a low state, like n equals 2, to the ground state, 
which is n equals 1. And the reason for that is because the energy difference between a low state and the ground state is less than the energy difference from a, a I guess you could say, at a high state to a low state. And the reason for that is because the energy levels of the electrons spread out. So, like, there's your first orbit, there's your second orbit, there's your third orbit. The difference in the energy here is less than the difference in the energy here, and that's less than the difference here. That's your energy levels, they get wider, further apart. Okay, so so that's more. say again. As, as they're further apart, it's more. Energy. As they're further apart, there are bigger differences between the energy levels. So you could say the difference in energy levels per orbit increase. Hence. Uh, as an example, the difference between energy state 5 and, say, energy state 2, that would be bigger than, say, the difference between 2 and the ground state. This is true, but I misread the question. So this is true, but I misread. They want to know uh, why you get more of this. So if you have your hot gas, they want to know why do you see more jumps like this than jumps like this. This is what they want to know too. So the reason is, if the gas is hot, uh, you're more likely, the electrons are more likely to be in higher energy states. So we just need to continue this. The difference in energy levels per orbit increases, hence that difference is bigger than that. Since the gas is hot, the higher states are more common. That's kind of a hard atoms question this year. Yeah. Yeah. Set it backwards. Oh, it's too early. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Decrease. <laughs> then it means I have it backwards. So actually, you know what? Uh, so that actually is useless. That doesn't explain anything then. So, uh, it's just that then. It's terrible. Terrible. I'm not fully awake yet. This is what happens when you have three days off in a row. Okay. Matt.
shall we continue? You got that okay? Thank you for pointing that out. Matt's somehow quite awake this morning. No Game of Thrones last night? Ten! Oh, well, that explains it. I went to bed at a terrible time of 2.30. Because, because of the what? Ah. Ah. Why do you have to wake at four? Yeah, but what is it that they have you doing? Ah. Five until what time? Five to twelve? Five a.m. to twelve noon. Oh. Five a.m. That sounds painful. So yeah. So nine thirty must feel very late for you then. You get to sleep until seven, you have to relax. Okay. Good man, good man. Right, what is meant by the wave particle duality of electrons? So uh, this means that electrons can at times act like waves and at other times act like particles. Now let's see if I got my one mark. Yep, I actually wrote more than I need. Electrons can behave both as wave and particles. Okay, next. Can we do the next one? Yeah. yeah. Complete the table to show the velocity and kinetic energy of particles to give the required wavelength. The mass of the proton is that. Okay, so um, the wavelength for both of these questions is given at the beginning as 4 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And you want the kinetic energy. And you want the velocity, is it? Oh, first we have to get the velocity. So we can use de Broglie's formula that says wavelength equals h over mv. So v equals h over m lambda. So the first question is the velocity of the electron. So that's going to be h, which is on your calculator over the mass of the electron, which they didn't give you, but they gave you the mass of the proton, which I think is a bit odd. So the mass of the electron times the wavelength, which is four times 10 to the minus 11. And then once you have that, uh, you have to get the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the electron is a half the mass of the electron times the answer you just got there squared and then see it's four marks of so this four calculations the next one would be the velocity of the proton that's h over mass of the proton times four times ten to the minus eleven you'll have your answer there and the kinetic energy of the proton is a half the mass of the proton and the velocity that you got of the proton squared. Okay, dokey. Uh, four answers, please, when you're ready.
is a 1.82 times 10 to the 7. Probably. So that's good. Uh, that means you're likely to get this answer right for the next one, so that's fine. Uh, and then the velocity, good, good. And then the velocity of the proton, you should get this. Then here, you should get this. Yeah. Oh, if they said to use that, then you better use it. Does it give a different answer? Uh, no. But it's less than yeah, you lose a mark. Uh, but I would hope the constant on the calculator is fairly close to this, though, right? It's close. How close? What is it? One point. Uh, maybe it's okay. Maybe we'll get lucky. Okay, the last part here is if both particles were accelerated from rest through the same potential difference, which would have the greatest wavelength? So what you have here is you have um, your plates, the particles at rest, and then it comes out the other side. Yeah? Now, um, what did we say? The it, it comes out, it has kinetic energy. Now, what would we say the energy was uh, for potential? It's uh, QV. Isn't that what we said? I think so. Because it's the formula QED and E is V over D. So it's charge multiplied by uh, voltage. Yeah. Anyways, it, I'm pretty sure it is that. I don't think that one, I don't know if that one's in the formula book, you see. So look, the kinetic energy will equal QV. So that means a half mv squared equals q times the voltage. And since both of them, electron and proton, they have the same charge, which is E times the voltage. So m will equal 2 ev. No, no, sorry, not m. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, get the v. v equals 2 ev over m square root and remember wavelength equals h over m v so that would be h over m root two no root m over two e v which equals h over root m e v. Now, the h is the same for both, the e is the same for both, and the v is the same for both. The only thing that's different for each one is the m. The wavelength is proportional to 1 over root m. So which one will have the greatest wavelength? whoever has the smaller mass. Who has the smaller mass? Well, the electron does. So the electron should have uh, the smaller wavelength. And it is the electron. Is that okay? Uh, you didn't need to do all the work that I did. 
it's it's something that you can remember as a fact nearly that the smaller the particle the bigger its wave length and wave like behavior will be so electrons will behave more like a wave than a proton because electrons are smaller than protons so it means also that they have bigger wavelengths uh, okay anything else in that paper no that's the end okay. so we'll jump back to version one where are we to continue from Did I do any of the answers or did I do some of these? I, I kind of remember doing... I kind of remember doing section A. Could you check your notes to see? What does it look like? Are we continuing from B1? Yeah, yeah, the same, same year, isn't it? Yeah, we get, we get to, um, in this class. Do we? Really? I don't feel like we did anything for section B, did we? We just did B5. B5? Why would I do that? I don't know why, but it's in my book. Maybe you did B5. Yeah, I did. B2? But maybe you just did B2. Will I just start with... I remember the energy for the big charge. Say again? You think we did B1? Okay, let me put it like this. You finished eight, so. Well, do you have, a, did you try B1? Do you have your attempt at B1? Yes. Good. Ah, uh, you were supposed to do this one at home. And deck. Um, Matt, do you have B2 done? Okay. Do you have all of B done? Which ones have you missed? Oh, Matt. Matt, Matt, Matt. Okay, this is what we'll do. Uh, let's do B1 now. We can check your answer, okay? Let's have a look. And then after I do B1 and B2, there might be a little time left. You can get start getting work on B3. Right, question A. A block of concrete has a length of 2 by 1.5 by a half a meter. What's the volume? Easy peasy. The volume is 2 by 1.5, then 0 0.5. What are you up to, Matt? You got a message? Is it Siva, Kim, and Chow? <laughs> All right, okay. Right. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, of course, because you don't have it printed in front of you, do you? Let me know when you're ready. Yeah? yeah. 
Okay. Right, next one. What is the mass of the concrete block? So you can have density is mass over volume. So mass is density by volume. And you're told that the, this is concrete. So it's 8,000 times 1.5. So that's 12,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Is that right, folks? Oh, concrete is 2,400. Steel is 8,000, sorry. Thank you. So it should have been uh, 2,400 times 1.5. So is that 33600? Yeah. yeah. Uh-oh, you're getting sleepy now, Matt. Okay, part three. If a bar of steel with a circular cross section and diameter 2.5 has mass 6, what's the length of the bar? Okay, so you've got a piece of steel. Um, it's 6 kilograms. And the diameter is 2.5 centimeters. What's the length? So look, you know that mass equals density by volume. And you also know that volume is pi r squared L, or H. That means that the L that you're looking for will be the mass over pi, uh, rho pi r squared. So that is 6 over 8,000 pi 0 0.0125. Squared, I hope. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? Let's see. An answer there? Yeah. That seems like a reasonable length, doesn't it? 1.53? Yeah. Okay, next. A second block is made using a mixture of steel and concrete. 5% is steel, 95% is concrete. What is the density of the block? Alright, so. Okay. Part four, density is mass over volume. That will be the mass of the uh, steel plus the mass of the concrete. And the volume is still the same volume, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same, it's the same volume. But I think what we need to do uh, yeah, volume 1 plus volume 2. And you can say density 1 is mass 1 over volume 1. And density 2 is mass 2 over volume 2. Now we don't know the masses. So I should change this into density 1 volume 1 plus density 2 volume 2 over volume 1 plus volume 2. Oh, I got a little sneaky trick here. I can divide everything by the total volume. So that's volume 1 over total volume, density 1, plus volume 2 over total volume, density 2, over volume 1 over total volume, plus volume 2 over total volume. Now, this is a sneaky little trick because 
we know what volume one over total volume is. It's 0 0.05 density one. And the other one is 0 0.95 density two. And um, volume one and volume two, they add up to one. So it's just going to be 0 0.05, which is steel, which is what, 8,000 we said? Plus 0 0.95 times 2,400. When you're ready. Two six eight. I'm just gonna check the answer to see how we're doing. Yep, 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 yep. So far so good. Okay. Continue. Yep. Now for part B. They give you a graph. Um, so you apply a force and you measure the extension. On the graph paper, plot extension against force. Okay, now I'm not going to do that in detail, but just to give you the idea, here you'll have um, extension, which is in units of 10 to the minus four meters. And on the y-axis you have force, which is in units of kilo newtons. And roughly speaking, you're going to get a straight line here. So obviously you obviously you do that on graph paper in the exam, and you get your four marks. Okay. Now the next thing we have to do is to calculate the uh, gradient. So what you're supposed to do on your graph paper, look, you're supposed to draw in a triangle. And then you say that the gradient, the slope, will be this length over this length. So um, that would be 30,000, because it's kilonewtons, if you measure that, over um, 6. 0.11 times 10 to the minus 4. So uh, what's that, please? Now, they want you to use that. Okay, so what are the units actually? Um, they are newtons per meter. That actually represents the K because you know the formula of Hooke's Law F equals K times extension. So that means the K is this guy. So that's K. Part 3 is they want you to get Young's modulus. So remember, uh, Young's modulus is stress, which is force over area, over strain, which is extension over natural length. I should have used L, sorry, L and L. But Hooke said force is K times extension over area, over extension over natural length they cancel and I get K L over area yeah what do you need to check Matt I can help you yeah that's Hooke's law is that in the book I hope so it is? Okay. Continue. Um, so, do we know K? We do. Do we know L? I think it's given in the question. We do, it's 2. And do we know the area? 
uh, we do. It's pi 0 0.0125 squared. So when you're ready, you can you can tell me what that is, please. Yeah, I'm just checking the answer here. Right. Thirty thousand. My. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I'm looking at the wrong answer. Yeah, no, this is. This is right, sorry. And what did you say this one was? And that's right. Okay. Uh, use the gradient. Oh no, I just did that. If the bar fractures at 204 megapascals, what is the tensile strength of the steel bar? Okay. Um, what is the tensile strength of the steel bar? Cool. Okay. So basically, do you remember tensile strength is the limit of when something breaks? So it's a force. How much force do you need to break something? Now, what did they give you? They didn't give you the force, they gave you the, the stress. So basically the question is this. If the stress is 204 megapascals, what's the force? So do you remember uh, stress is force over area? So force is area times stress. And the area is pi or squared times 204 times 10 to the 6 and we're finished once we have that so is it 100 kilopascals roughly i'm oh, sorry kilo newtons yeah okay two So, um, what is meant by the EMF? Ah, that's the long definition. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's funny because when different people write the exams, They have their own, yeah, well, not all definite, different standards for how much you need to write. So this guy uh, has a, I'm just looking at the marking scheme, he has a very short definition of what EMF is. It's the energy per unit charge provided by a source. It's an extremely small definition. Okay. Uh, what is the resistance in the lamp? Right. So what do we know? We know the EMF. Uh, when switch A is open, there's that current and that voltage. So we know the current, we know the voltage, uh, the switch is open. Yeah, so is this, we could just use, oh, we know the EMF, good. So we could use, we could use Kirchhoff or something, because, oh, could we? Oh, 
actually weak. We know... Oh, I need to draw this. Okay, here we go. Dun, 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 dun. We have a resistor here. So here, uh, well, we have a little resistor here as well. So we don't know this guy. We know that this is 15 volts. And, ah, oh, yeah, look, we know this guy here is 14.5 volts. So that means we know that this guy here is half a volt because the total has to add up to 15. And we also know that the current here is 0 0.25 amps. Yeah, so if we just use our triangle, the OR will be 14.5 over 0 0.25. What's that? 29.58 ohms? Let me check if I'm right. Huzzah, I am right. Okay, next they want the resistance here. So, you could just do the same thing, couldn't you? It'd be R equals V, which is 0 0.5 over 0 0.25, right? Two ohms. Yeah, okay, so far so good. Switch A is closed and the total current of two amps now flows through the battery. Determine the voltage across the motor under these conditions. So what they've done is basically they've added in a second resistor. So what I'm going to do is add the two resistors together. So that's one over R equals, do we know the resistance of the motor? Or we don't? Oh, okay, so I'll have to draw it again. Okay. So, we have here... This little fella, we said is 2 ohms. This guy here, what do we say? 58 ohms? I know I didn't quite draw this right because it's the other way around, but it doesn't matter. There's the motor. Uh, we'll say it's 4 ohms. And we also know that here we have two amps. Oh, and we also know that the battery still is a 15 volt battery. And the question is determine the voltage across the motor that's across this guy here. <coughs> So what I'm thinking is, uh, what formula would be best here? Do I want to use Kirchhoff? We'll use Kirchhoff, I like Kirchhoff. We'll call that I1 and that I2. So we know that I1 plus I2 has to equal 2. And what I'll do is I'll take an outside loop. So I get 15 minus 2 times 2, which is 4, minus I2 or, that should equal 0. Oh, I need three equations. Fine. Um, the top one now. 15 minus 4 minus 58i1, that should equal 0. Okay, so 15 minus 4 is 11. So 11 over 58 equals i1. So then that means i2 equals 2 minus 11 over 58. So then that means or will be 11 over i2. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what's that, please? Oh, wait. Let me 
destroy the determine the voltage oh flip it I determine the resistance determine the voltage across the motor that doesn't matter give me the resistance and I'll just use it to get the voltage Six point zero seven ohms. Okay, so then that means V two is I two times or. Okay, so what's that? Yeah. Which is correct. I did this probably the longest way you could possibly do it because I found uh, I didn't need to find the OR. It doesn't matter. Right. Uh, state what happened to the brightness of the lamp when the switch is closed. So, uh, where's the lamp? The lamp was the lamp was this guy here. This was the lamp. Can you see? That was the lamp. The 58 ohms. Uh, so what happens when you close the switch and now you have both of these connected? Do you think, what do you think happens to the brightness there? Decreases. Say again? Decreases. Are you, which, which word are you saying? Brightness decreases. Decreases, okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, yep, correct. Decreases for one mark. Uh, and now... Well, okay, so the, the next part is why. So why does it, uh, why does it decrease? Current was. Yeah, um, the current was 11 over 58. Oh, so I guess it's okay that I did this because I can say now, it, what is 11 over 58? Is that much less than 0 0.25? What is it actually? It's 0 0.49. So I can say current drops from 0 0.25 to 0 0.19 amps. Okay. Oh, so hence P which equals I squared R reduces. The output power reduces. Okay, next. Semiconductor diodes are used. Sketch a circuit that would allow the current voltage characteristic of a diode to be investigated with the diode drawn in forward bias. So uh, this is what you did in your experiment. It's just the circuit for the characteristic curve. So you remember the story here. You have a, 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 a power supply. You have your, your switch. You have your ammeter. Um, and then you have your diode, which is this symbol. Oh goodness, I hope so. Isn't it? Let me check the answer, see if they have it. They don't have the picture. Let me do a quick Google here. Symbol for diode. Uh, yeah, it's the triangle, but it's not in a circle. What the heck am I thinking of? Ah, I'm thinking of the the light dependent diode. Yeah, it's the triangle, but no circle. Yeah, okay. Oh, and what else am I missing from my picture? I need my voltmeter here. Have I got everything? I've got everything, don't I? Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I'm so asleep this morning. You're absolutely right. I completely forgot about my variable resistor. Because how am I supposed to change the voltage? Okay, let's stick it there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
sketch a graph to show the characteristics you expect to see for the so sketch what graph you expect to see okay so can you see that okay here you have your voltage and here you have your current and if you remember the graph um, it's kind of flat for a little bit and then it, it shoots up and I think we said that this is around about at 0 0.9 volts I think it's the number we said 0 0.7 not 0 0.9 is a bit too big oh thank you okay 0. Point. so we'll go with 7 then uh, and then it goes further back much longer and then it falls down here uh, and what's this called this is called a uh, runaway isn't it runaway breakdown okay. Okay, can I do the last part? Yeah. So the last part um, is a diode in parallel can protect an ammeter. Explain how. Okay. So these are the two situations you have. First you can have, um, I'm going to just draw it. There is your ammeter, and there is your diode, <coughs> and then here is your ammeter again, and there is your diode. Okay. Now, this is what happens. Let's look at the situation when you have a low current. And then we'll look at what happens when you have a high current. By the way, high currents can break the ammeter. This is the problem. Uh, so I should say low, low current and voltage and then high current and voltage. So when I and V are low, then in this picture, uh, the OR here, I should put a little OR here. The OR is uh, high, and the reason for that is if you look at the, uh, it's gone now, but when we had the graph a moment ago, uh, here the OR is high, and then for this part here it's low, because remember the slope is 1 over the OR. So when the graph is flat, the resistance is high, and when it's steep, the resistance is low. So when you are in the low voltage, low current situation, the OR is high. Now if you look at the formula, you know what, I'll call this OR, small OR, just so I'm not mixing it up with something else. Okay. The OR is high. Now the total resistance equals, oh I need a different OR here, I'll call it OR. A or A. The total resistance is 1 over or A plus 1 over or. Now if this or is big then this fraction here 1 over or big or small? Well it'll be small because it's 1 over a big number. So then you can say 1 over or is roughly equal to 1 over or A. So in other words the total resistance is roughly the same as the resistance in the ammeter and this ammeter resistance is usually small, so that's actually usually quite uh, small. Uh, and so therefore, the diode has no effect. The diode isn't really affecting the circuit here, because it's, uh, it's, it's like there's no resistance here. 
So you can measure the current without worrying about the resistance affecting it. Now in this situation here, the R is low. So that means 1 over R, which equals 1 over RA plus 1 over R. This guy here is not zero. This here, this will be quite big. So it means 1 over R is roughly equal to 1 over the resistance in the diode. Uh, in other words, the diode, we say, dominates and takes all the current because it is all of the resistance. So I kind of like to explain this one with a picture. Um, you, can, you can explain it as a series of events that happen. So if you want to give the answer as a paragraph, if large current is flowing through the ammeter, voltage across it increases, then voltage rises in diode and it begins to conduct further current. You wrote that down or, or something yeah okay so that's question one and two you said you've done three four five perfect uh, so if you can get a start on those now